Hello and welcome to this City University ESS Eric and at SEN Social Research webinar. I'm delighted to be welcoming Renee Bautista um, from NORC, who's going to be talking to us about a familiar topic to many of us, I'm sure, moving a face-to-face -face survey to an online survey. Um, my name's Debbie Collins. I'm a research director at NATSEN. Um, we're going to be using the Q&A down at the bottom of your screens for questions. If you have questions for Rene during his talk, please use the Q&A. And then at the end of his talk, which will be around 45 minutes, we'll take um, questions. Um, OK, so with no further ado, let me hand over to Rene. Thank you, Debbie. I appreciate the invitation. It's an honor to be with you, sharing some of the work that uh, we've been doing with the uh, GSS. I'm uh, hoping that you can see my uh, my presentation, my slides. Um, the plan for today is that I'm going to cover three major topics around the GSS. I'm going to talk about uh, measuring changes in society through the GSS. Then I'm going to transition into changes uh, that we did to our survey methodology in order to be able to conduct the GSS in 2020. And then um, a few notes on what's the future for uh, the GSS moving forward. Um, all right, so let's let's get started with the first topic, uh, which is... Renee, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We can't see your slides. Oh, um, have you thank you for, yes, no, thank you for letting me know. I was sure that, uh, uh, let me see, the beauties of our days, right? Needing to deal with Zoom, et cetera. Can you, can you see my slides now? Yes, okay, I can, perfect. thank you. Okay, thank you. excellent, all right. Sorry about that, sorry about that. Um, okay, so here are the three topics that I mentioned uh, before. And I'm gonna start with the first one, which is uh, measuring changes in, in society with, with the GSS. Um, the GSS is um, a relatively old uh, survey. It started in 1972, um, created originally by Jim Davis at University of Chicago with intention to provide high quality data to the social science community. And the main goal was to measure societal change. Um, the survey has been conducted by NORC uh, for all those years and is the second largest or most widely used data set in social sciences in the United States after um, the studies conducted by the US Census Bureau. It's currently considered a, uh, a National Science Foundation infrastructure, which is great news for us, obviously, because it's the equivalent of you know, having a telescope or um, you know, major infrastructure in the natural sciences, but for the social sciences. The GSS has traditionally supported development, testing, and refining of uh, theories across different fields, uh, sociology, um, psychology, political science, economics, etc. And the goal of the GSS has always been to preserve reliability and comparability of data over time, uh, precisely to enable discoveries and being able to uh, create a long time uh, trend series. It, it is the only large scale probability survey designed to monitor changes in, in the United States. Um, and, and that has represented obviously a challenge, uh, balancing stability and innovation as in any major um, general social survey, uh, there is no central topic for us. It, the study covers a variety of topics ranging from politics, social life, uh, civil liberties, religion, abortion, um, beliefs in afterlife, etc. Uh, it's it's quite broad, and uh, the GSS stresses replication in comparability over time. The GSS receives guidance from a scientific advisory board, and uh, the intention for that is to precisely uh, create an instrument that serves the needs of the social science community. So it's not dominated by uh, any research agenda that PIs may have. Um, the GSS was born with intention of giving uh, equal access to users. Uh, it was born at a time where um, researchers with um, 
resources with contacts, et cetera, would have access to funding and collect data, high quality data. Um, and, and the GSS helped uh, precisely uh, answer that, that existing need um, 50 or so years ago by giving everybody access, uh, no matter their uh, level of seniority, graduate students, uh, people from the public, media, uh, tenure professors, et cetera. And uh, the story of the GSS has been always uh, collaborative in nature. Uh, the GSS currently is part of the International Social Survey Program, uh, which a few of you may, may know, uh, that includes over 40 countries around the world uh, coordinating on uh, specific modules conducted every year. Uh, those modules vary by topic. And in the year of 2020, uh, the GSS, for the first time, had a collaboration with another major study in the United States, the American National Election Studies. And the idea um, was and was ultimately implemented to do a follow-up survey um, with uh, GSS respondents, but using a questionnaire from the American National Election Studies. Uh, the GSS for the most part measures aspects that are related to uh, sociological, um, topics, content, and uh, the ANES, or the American National Election Studies, uh, focuses on political participation and aspects that are more relevant to the political science community. Uh, so for the first time, the, those two major studies um, join efforts to have a richer data set. Uh, and the GSS has um, remained uh, true to that original mission of uh, supporting uh, collaborative research, et cetera. And I wanted to uh, briefly present an overview of how the GSS looks behind scenes. We have our board of overseers. Um, currently the board chair is Brian Powell. Uh, we have senior advisors, uh, Tom Smith, who for uh, decades directed um, the GSS and, and made great contributions to the GSS. Um, we have a, a statistical and methodological advisor, uh, Colm Morkitite. We have a, a lead principal investigator uh, here at NORC, Michael Davern, uh, myself, and we uh, the uh, principal investigator team, and also I serve as director of the GSS. And we have academic uh, principal investigators, uh, Jeremy Fries, uh, Pam Hurd, and Steve Morgan. And we have a large team uh, that contributes to, to the GSS. So I'm representing today a very large group of you know, talented individuals committed to high quality data. The cycle for the GSS uh, usually starts by deciding what to include in, in the questionnaire. As I mentioned before, the GSS uh, puts particular emphasis on um, keeping our content constant so we can compare over time. So every time we need to decide uh, what needs to be renewed, moved, or uh, um, needs to stay in the questionnaire. We make those decisions along with our board uh, once um, new items may have been identified to be included in, in the questionnaire, and those items can come from our own board and, and also come from uh, an open uh, competition that we have. We call for new content uh, every time that we conduct the, the, uh, the survey, and the survey is conducted every other year. So anyone can propose um, content, new content for the GSS, and the board evaluates that. So once the board has identified what content is uh, promising for the GSS, we conduct a cognitive usability and timing testing on those items uh, with the intention of uh, reporting back to our board, telling them what are the more uh, promising items or items that may need more work. And once that has been uh, determined, we go ahead and start uh, putting together our questionnaire. Um, obviously, we... Uh, um, draw a representative sample. This is based on a scientific sample. After that, we do a short pilot testing uh, to make sure that our protocols are working as intended. Then we go ahead and collect the data with actual respondents and disseminate results. And obviously the cycle starts all over again. Just to give you a sense on how the questionnaire looks, um, the GSS uh, relies on three sub-questionnaires within the major questionnaire, we call those ballots. So there are three ballots um, in the GSS and each ballot will have similar content. 
So there's background, info, background information across the three ballots. Uh, core content, content that typically does not change over time. So we call that the replicating core. Uh, there are obviously changes over time um, in the margins, for, but for the most part that remains stable. And also we include modules from those who may have submitted a proposal for new content to the GSS or some sponsored modules. Uh, we work with some uh, agencies and universities as well who want to be part of the GSS. So they help us um, fund the GSS. And so through that mechanism, we um, support the, um, the funding of the study and enrich the content of, of the questionnaire. So for, for example, we've been working with, um, with CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control here in the United States to measure uh, a module on um, risky behaviors, for example. Um, then we have ISSV modules, which has been part of the GSS for a long time. And then at the end of the questionnaire, um, recontact and validation information. So there, there is some overlap across those uh, three ballots, but um, we try to balance the content so not to have a, an extremely long uh, questionnaire and uh, try to minimize uh, respondent burden there. As I mentioned before, core uh, content covers um, a vast number of uh, topics um, than the typical, the topical models that I mentioned before, and then the ISSP modules, which are very rich in content and, and change in every cycle. All right, so that's the background for, for the GSS. Let's, let's talk about now about uh, the part that uh, changes are needed to change uh, in 2020 for the GSS. Before, before uh, getting there, just wanted to um, include a note on an idea that uh, Tom W. Smith, my uh, predecessor um, um, in what I do now, um, put together and put forward eventually. Uh, those, um, those two principles have been critical for the GSS. He uh, put forward two laws of studying societal change inspired by uh, Isaac Asimov's uh, Laws of Robotics uh, from 1950 uh, or so. And um, I'm going to jump into the actual two laws that um, Tom um, put together uh, based on, on that background. And the first law is that the way to measure change is not to change the measure, which makes a lot of sense, obviously, to have comparability over time. And that has been the paradigm uh, for the GSS for, for many years. We um, maintain the same mode of data collection. We maintain the same wording. We maintain the same protocol. Everything all more or less identical. So um, with the intention of keeping everything clean, um, so to be able to, to detect true change in, in public opinion. Um, there's a second law that was advanced by uh, Tom and th that says when constant measure produce no constant measurement, change the measure to, to, me to measure change. Um, and that's usually when um, things have changed in society, like uh, how certain terms have been used, uh, the meaning of words have changed, etc. So there are good reasons sometimes to, to change the measures. But overall, um, everything remains constant. However, what happened in 2020 was kind of unprecedented new and uh, in my head sort of calls for perhaps start thinking about a third law in, in, in inspiring the same uh, set of ideas uh, that Tom borrowed from. I, I, I wonder if you know, a measure must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. We'll see. In 2020, we had prepared our instrument to be conducted face-to-face. -face. We had prepared to conduct a study on tablets. On tablets. Um, at some point in history, the, the GSS was conducted based on paper-based instruments and eventually transitioned to a, a computer-assisted person interviewing or CAPI. And in 2020, we were hoping to innovate data collection with tablets. So we had uh, created all the protocols, tested, uh, and we were ready uh, to go to the field. And then, boom, uh, COVID-19 happened. 
uh, on March 13th, uh, the United States federal authorities declared a national emergency, shelter in place measures, social distancing guidelines. Um, and, and you all may remember that perhaps the experience around the world was slightly different, but overall, um, many people thought that, well, perhaps this is, you know, which was going to last for a couple of weeks. We all uh, um, observe a quarantine for a couple of weeks and then we'll go back to normal. Um, we didn't know much about what's happening uh, back then. And we needed to start making decisions in, in, in the GSS. What do we do? Do we go back to the field? But that felt kind of very uncertain. Uh, that will be actually uh, in violation to the guidelines issued by the federal government. And we started to wait, but at the same time that we waited, we didn't want to just be sitting on in our hands, right? So we needed to proactively think on what could we do? Obviously one option was let's wait um, and perhaps skip this year and measure uh, next year. And let's see if we can perhaps, you know, we, we thought of different ideas. Uh, what if we instead uh, try to uh, just have a shorter version of the questionnaire on a cross-sectional survey uh, and many other ideas that, that um, we discussed with our stakeholders. As I mentioned before, we have a lot of people around us uh, contributing to the GSS. And the two leading alternatives back then were uh, conducting a panel study. Um, meaning going back to participants who responded to GSS in 2016 and 2018. The GSS, as I mentioned before, is conducted every other year um, and interview them with a shorter questionnaire. Um, we were hoping that by telling them that we needed their help uh, again and um, offering some uh, token of appreciation in exchange for their contribution to the study would be helpful. Um, and then the second idea that, that, that we had was to do the uh, cross-sectional survey with an address-based sampling and uh, implementing a, a, a mail push-to-web methodology. Ultimately, we decided to uh, act on those two ideas. So we did a panel study. We went back to 2016 and 18 respondents. And also we did a cross-sectional survey. So the panel survey, obviously, uh, it's based on the sample that we had initially uh, drawing 16 and 18. Uh, there are some issues of attrition um, as any panel uh, because it was essentially an unmaintained panel. Uh, nevertheless, it was quite successful. Before doing the panel, we launched a small pilot to see if uh, people would be willing to respond, if we were able to uh, locate them. Uh, we got encouraging findings from that pilot, so we decided to go ahead and do it. For the cross-sectional survey, um, need needless to say, we needed to reconsider the mode of data collection, so uh, no in-person. Uh, we decided to do it on the web, and that meant obviously changing the questionnaire, uh, adapting from face-to-face -to, -face to web. We do do um, telephone surveys uh, as supplementary mode for those who may request it. Um, it's based on, on the same uh, selected sample, uh, but uh, we offer that possibility for individuals who may otherwise not be able to do the survey. Luckily, the GS has uh, had conducted research on um, changes due to mode, um, specifically uh, trying to adapt some of the metrics to the web uh, back in 2016. But in 2020, we, we didn't plan for doing a web study. Uh, we needed to do it out of need uh, based on what happened. So the traditional GSS, uh, what I mentioned before, the, the, uh, the way to measure change is not to change the measure, needed to be um, discussed, revisited, and ultimately we needed to modify the, the study. So instead of relying on um, the face-to-face, -face, uh, we switched to uh, uh, um, uh, web modes, and then um, we, we have those two uh, studies now, study one and study two. They are not merged, they are independent. Um, currently, the panel data is available to users. Uh, we are still working on the cross-sectional survey data. Uh, we're hoping to release the data at some point by the end of this month. 
For uh, the GSS uh, study one, which is the panel, we saw merits in, in doing that because that would allow people to study uh, changes at the person level. One of the considerations that we had when uh, trying to decide what to do with GSS is whether it would make sense to measure data in 2020. There was a lot happening in the United States in the year of 2020. Uh, there was a presidential election, um, a um, um, the senior census was being conducted, uh, lots of uh, um, civil movements um, and civic unrest happened in, around the US. We didn't know obviously that some of those would happen in the summer of 2020 uh, when we were discussing in the spring what to do. And I'm so glad that we decided to collect data because we were able to capture uh, some of that uh, change in our questionnaire. Granted, we won't be able to fully disentangle whether some of the changes that we may have captured are strictly due to societal changes or due to the change in methodology. That's, I'm hoping, um, a topic that will be answered by uh, brilliant minds out there, uh, people studying uh, a public opinion, students working on PhD dissertations or a master thesis, whatever they are doing, uh, academics, etc. I'm hoping that they can help us uh, understand what what may have happened in the year of 2020. Uh, the GSS has always been committed to transparency, so we're putting the data out there uh, with full documentation of what we did. In that, um, as well, uh, the, the panel uh, supports the collaboration that I mentioned before with the American National Election Studies. Um, this is just a, a screenshot of what we have in our documentation to illustrate the collaboration with the American National Election Studies. So uh, as I mentioned before, we took sample from 2016, recontacted um, them, uh, same for 2018, and then we moved them into the um, GSS panel study with a shorter questionnaire. In the data set, you will see that uh, variables coming from 2016 and 18 are marked with underscore one to indicate that that's study one. Uh, and then the questionnaire conducted in 2020, variables coming from that questionnaire are marked with uh, underscore two. So, so that's the uh, suffix of the variable. Uh, for A, for the suffix underscore one, we have A and B to distinguish the source of the data, whether 2016 or 2018. Uh, and the documentation is available for our users. Uh, the study number two, uh, it's based on uh, address-based sampling uh, with the so-called uh, mail push to web methodology. We thought that it was important to have fresh sample because the panel data uh, perhaps again would be affected by attrition. Uh, we did not refresh that sample, the 16 and 18. Um, data. So instead, we decided to do a, a fresh sample study. That's our uh, cross-sectional study. We decided to uh, apply or administer the uh, whole questionnaire, the whole GSS questionnaire, uh, to that fresh sample. And that would also um, allow us to, or that would allow us to do, or to keep collaborating with the ISSP. We needed to redesign the whole questionnaire. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, about that in a moment uh, to be able to uh, do the web mode. But um, I wanted to share with you the basic um, overview for uh, the mail push to web methodology. So we started by sending uh, a postcard to respondents, uh, inviting them to get access to the web study, uh, the conventional um, um, uh, terminology was included in a postcard with a scratch off feature in there so people can uh, scratch, off, scratch off and see their pin if they wanted to uh, join right away. Um, but obviously we needed to send a more formal invitation package explaining uh, what the study was about <clears throat> with a nice letter, uh, a brochure, a magnet, a uh, prepaid incentive, Etc. and send a series of reminders, uh, sending them, reminding them uh, of the invitation. Um, and one of the reminders, for instance, we included an academic letter or uh, people from around the country um, having um, academic appointments endorsing our study. Uh, also another letter um, telling 
participants why this was important, emphasizing that the study has uh, a great impact across different areas, public policy, research, the media, etc. Um, <clears throat> I want to show you in a moment uh, some of the production metrics that we saw with that methodology. But before, before doing that, just walking you through some of the uh, challenges that we experienced when converting the GSS. Um, we needed to take into consideration the type of device uh, that respondents could have potentially um, uh, used out there when answering the questionnaire. So we tested the questionnaire across multiple devices, testing on different operating systems, different browsers, uh, making sure that it, the questionnaire was rendered appropriately on different screen size, resolutions, et cetera, and also taking into consideration uh, technical literacy of uh, respondents. So we uh, tried to, to do um, as much as we could in record time, because again, remember that we were pretty much ready to go uh, for the in-person, but we needed to quickly uh, pivot to the new mode um, and then um, accommodate for all those uh, different potential situations. <clears throat> the other major adaptations that we did was on um, question uh, wording, uh, rephrasing some of what we had in adapting response options. So let me show you an example. Uh, here's one well-known um, item from the GSS, which measures uh, priority on national spending. On the left, you will see the version that has been typically used for a face-to-face -face study. And it says, I, right? First, I would like to talk with you about some things people think about today. And then it says, we are faced with many problems in this country, none of which can be solved easily or inexpensively. I'm going to name some of, some of these problems. And for each one, I would like you to tell me whether you think we are spending too much money on it, too little money, or about the right amount. The issue with this is that in, in, in a web instrument, the uh, first person pronoun I may not work well. And then same with we. So if we switch from I to we for the web, as you will see <clears throat> on the version on the right hand side, it says, we would like to talk with you. And then uh, in blue says, we are faced with many problems in the country, but it's unclear if that second we refers to we as a country or we as organization asking uh, the questions, right? So that, that, that could have been potentially confusing. <clears throat> So we, we continued reviewing that. We engaged with discussions with our board members because no one really wanted to change the metric uh, fundamentally because of the reasons that I mentioned before, right? We wanted to keep everything constant. Um, so we ended up needed to do uh, more aggressive rewarding of the question. And we landed on the version that I have here as version two, um, dropping the first sentence, like the first we would like to talk with you about some of the people think about today with let's begin with, right? So that would entirely get rid of the I, we discussion. And then <clears throat> just leaving the we to signal that it refers to we as a country. Then we needed to develop a few other metrics, excuse me, uh, sentences in there to make it consistent and then uh, make it uh, um, also um, suitable for the web following sort of conventional practices for web surveys. And that's going to, um, most likely have an, a measurement um, uh, effect on the metrics. We still don't know what, may, what will happen. Uh, we're still in data and we're going to release the data and everybody will have a chance to explore uh, uh, results and, and, and help figure out what may have happened. Another change that we needed to deal with is the don't knows. Um, typically the GSS has not included don't knows, um, but uh, the GSS given that uh, has relied traditionally on uh, interviewers can accommodate don't know. So if that person say don't know, you know, a, an interviewer would be able to capture that in interviewer notes or through some function keys in the computer and then be able to record that. But for the web, uh, we, we needed to decide whether including or not including don't knows. We decided to uh, not include don't knows for opinion questions <clears throat> and include don't knows for instances where the, the interviewer, excuse me, the respondent would have legitimate reasons to say, I don't know. <clears throat> but uh, in order to minimize the potential effects of having a very explicit don't know in there, we grayed out the don't know option 
uh, in the web. So I'm representing that here in my in my slide with the don't know at the end of the second column that is grayed out, sort of to illustrate that uh, we try to move it away from the main set of response categories and just leave it in there in case people were really motivated to, um, to find the don't know alternative. Another change that we did <clears throat> was how to measure sex. Um, the GSS for many years relied on interviewer observation to code sex of the individual being interviewed. In the web mode, obviously that's not possible. Uh, so we needed to include questions. Now the question was which questions are the right items to include. Um, the GSS had been doing before uh, research on how to measure uh, sex identity, orientation, et cetera. So we took uh, that, that, that research and also a research that has been conducted by one of our supporters uh, to bring those metrics uh, as the main items uh, which we will rely <clears throat> to create uh, sex metrics. So we included uh, questions on sexual orientation and, and sexual identity, and those will be the basis now to produce uh, sex as a variable in the, in the questionnaire. There were other um, equally challenging aspects, what to do with volunteer responses that oftentimes happen in face-to-face in -face modes. In the face-to-face -face mode, um, it's possible again to record those people saying, oh, gee, it really depends. Uh, well, the interviewer is trying to capture some of that after the interviewer notes uh, and other mechanisms, and then have a record of that if that's volunteered. <clears throat> But in the web, we can't we can't accommodate volunteered responses without explicitly putting something in there, right? Um, another uh, major decision point was what to do with grid um, questions. Do we grid? Do we we do we not grid questions? The GSS is a quite long instrument. Uh, on average, is roughly ninety minutes long, um, even assisted by an interviewer. Um, and we were afraid that in the web it took even longer because uh, there would be no one uh, helping the respondent navigate uh, questions. And some of the questions in the GSS have a long history. They, they were developed back in the 50s with literature from the 40s, the 30s perhaps, and then they followed different standards back then. Uh, but again, with the intention of you know, measuring change and not changing the measure, uh, we still need to keep some of that, but the interviewer is trying to help the respondent understand that in face-to-face, -face, that that's not possible on the web. Um, but in the web, currently, um, uh, some practices uh, suggest that grading items might not be necessarily a bad idea, especially if you don't abuse grids. Uh, so what, that was another decision point for us. And also um, updating some of the language that we had in the questions using now, uh, gender neutral wording for some of the questions instead of uh, using uh, gendered nouns uh, to refer to certain individuals. So now using a person instead of he or she. I'm going to show you an example in a moment. Since it wasn't clear for us and I'm sorry what to do, uh, we decided to do an experiment and try to capture what the effect um, might be due to some of these instances. Um, so we had three experiments in the GSS and that's going to be documented as well for our uh, cross-sectional study. And um, here's an example of experiment number one, volunteered responses. The example that I have here is in general, do you think the courts in this area deal too harshly or not harshly enough with criminals. In the control version, which is a face-to-face, -face, um, it's just two options, too harshly or not too harshly. Um, we kept that as a control in the web and also had an experimental uh, mode with about right, uh, which mimics the volunteered response option that uh, would have been provided in the face-to-face -face mode. We had 19 variables um, allocated to this experiment. The experiment number two uh, was on, on grids. Uh, for questions, greeting or not, that's pretty straightforward. Here I have an example on abortion. Um, the experimental version obviously uses uh, a matrix design, this, this greeting, um, versus having a single item uh, presentation for, for questions. The experiment number three is related to what I mentioned before on, on gender neutral wording. <clears throat> Here the key change is highlighted in red. So the control would be, should he be allowed to speak? 
uh, should this person be allowed to speak? This is in reference to uh, civil liberty questions. We had also uh, a good number of variables allocated to that. What we learned uh, through those three experiments? Well, we saw that the volunteered response options can significantly change uh, distribution of cases. Here's an example on a question that is uh, whose mnemonic is age. Um, the question reads, as you know, many older people share a home with their grown children. Do you think this is generally a good idea or bad idea? As you see in the control, the it depends uh, is just 2% and that's mostly coming from the phone uh, mode. Because I mentioned before, we supplement the phone when individuals uh, want to do the survey on the phone. So someone receiving the invitation letter saying, I don't want to do this on the web. I'd rather call you guys and then do the survey. And we, have, we supported that option. But the experiment, when we offer the e depends on the web, it goes up to 61%. That fundamentally changes uh, the composition, the, the frequency of uh, proportions for this item, right? So um, <clears throat> roughly out of the uh, 14 variables that we included for that experiment, uh, 13 are, are showing some level of uh, significant changes. They varied in uh, intensity, but suggest that uh, indeed um, that change in the, in the wording, excuse me, the response category, it's important for our users to know. The experiment on, on gender neutral and uh, in grieving questions uh, showed mixed results. It's not clear entirely if uh, there is a significant effect going on there. Some items were affected, others not so much. Um, we still need to investigate more. Um, and uh, the data will be available there for people to continue to research on this, but it's an area that we're planning on investigating in the future. Okay, so let's talk about uh, sampling and some of the challenges around sampling and survey participation uh, with the adaptation. This is the basic protocol <clears throat> that we followed <clears throat> to uh, collect the data. We um, started, as I mentioned before, with a pre-notification card for the mail. And when we had uh, um, information from respondents, um, this is for the cross-section, we called them on the phone. We tried to match selected addresses to uh, phones from existing uh, data sources available out there and, and trying to see if uh, we could connect with individuals and uh, trying to invite them into the survey. And also following up with email sales, following the same, same, um, same ideas and logic uh, for, the, uh, for the outreach. We had uh, three batches for our sample. Um, we, we targeted um, originally 3,000 completes. We ended up exceeding our goal. Uh, we reached uh, more than 4,000 cases. Uh, based on our efforts to connect with people. Again, this is all the cross-sectional study. Um, the three batches, or the, excuse me, the first two batches had an initial uh, more or less equal number of sample lines. And then the third batch was a bit smaller uh, and always is, it's a balancing act, right? Because that's going to have an effect on how we calculate response rates. Uh, but the, the, these are the basic numbers. And here are the um, production uh, uh, numbers that I mentioned before. We saw uh, strong uh, production for the three batches. Uh, they were launched at different time points. Batch one was launched on December the 1st of uh, 2020. Um, we conducted a panel first in, in August. We started in August, I think, and ended in uh, early October of, 20, of 2020. And um, then we launched the, the cross-sectional study, which is what I'm presenting here. Um, so the first batch was on December the 1st. We were somewhat nervous about launching right before the holidays. Um, but uh, here you can see that batch one is the purple line. So that, that uh, behaved nicely for us, especially the first uh, a few weeks. Um, when you compare the first batch, which was launched on December 1st versus to the other batches, second batch was launched on January the 1st, and the third batch was launched on February the 24th. Um, so batch one um, it, it wasn't um, as impacted by the holidays as we originally thought it would, uh, which is great news. Um, and then um, 
how they how the trajectory behaves it's it's quite um, it's quite the same more or less follows the same pattern another uh, important aspect that we also um, tested on the GSS this time around was for the panel study when we reinterviewed 2016 and 18 respondents and we implemented our indicators as some of you may know the goal of our indicators are to is to achieve um, an adequate uh, representation of the sample, uh, monitoring sample composition and making sure that we represent the right groups. Um, for the first time we, we attempted to do that, we were able to do um, this because since it was a panel study, we had information from 16 and 18 respondents from 2016 and 18 respondents, and we were able to model um, potential participation based on correlates, both coming from the survey frame and coming also from uh, uh, survey responses. And uh, I, I won't bore you with details on the, 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 um, the logic behind um, uh, our indicators, but for, for many years, uh, non-response has been seen traditionally as a difference between respondents and non-respondents. Um, adjusted by uh, a response rate, participation rate, but that has changed more recently to understand this through covariability and understanding um, uh, the covariance between um, the uh, metric of interest of those who participate with the propensity to participate. And our indicators are more or less um, uh, following that new uh, literature or you know, the new current uh, on, on, on the literature, trying to um, um, maximize participation and more importantly, have a representative sample. Um, those two things may not be necessarily consistent all the time, having high response rate and having a representative sample, but to the extent possible, we aim for that. Um, so, uh, but going back to the GSS in, in, in bringing back what I mentioned before, we used information from those previous respondents and calculated the probability to participate. Um, some colleagues uh, from my team have conducted research on this. They presented a couple of papers at uh, the past April conference. I'm including here the citations in case you are interested in, in knowing more about that. Uh, but the gist of it is that the um, uh, our indicator model relies on, on a logistic regression model, having as dependent variable participation and uh, having predictors, a series of uh, variables that were important. And, and here are our predictors for the modeling. So we had a combination of demographic variables as well as um, data from, from, from our study, from the survey. Uh, 15 items from the survey and in parallel that was collected throughout the year. Um, here's a screenshot of how the data set uh, looks on the back end once you've uh, uh, conducted the, the modeling. Uh, and we sorted um, some of the scores uh, so to see those who were more likely to be underrepresented all the way down to those that were more likely to be overrepresented and those in between. And based on that, um, that um, classification, we decided to uh, do also an experiment to see if real-time intervention would help us improve the representativeness of our uh, sample. So for those who were considered to be likely um, um, underrepresented, we had two conditions. Condition one was to give them priority and increase incentives. And the second condition was just to keep working as usual with no prioritization. So for the first condition, we allocated um, 548 cases for the condition that I'm calling here 1B, just 200 cases. For the fairly represented cases, um, th there was no prioritization, no changes, and the overrepresented, we, we just stopped uh, trying to contact them and recruiting them into the into the survey. Uh, we did not stop them, obviously, from completing. We let them uh, continue or take cases from the web if they wanted to, but uh, it was just condition 1A uh, for which we did uh, real-time intervention and more aggressively uh, contact them and offered uh, more uh, incentives. 
What we saw is that for that condition, condition 1A, uh, we saw an increase uh, in percentage of completes, 19.6%. Uh, which compares to the other percentages for instances where, where we did not be, do intervention. Um, there are different, obviously, sample cases in there, which may prevent some of the comparability in there. But at least it's going in, into the right direction, or it's encouraging to see that real-time intervention based on our indicators um, may be promising. OK, so my last uh, point for this presentation is where are we going? What is next for the GSS? Um, what we're planning on doing in 2022 is to conduct an experiment comparing face-to-face uh, -face and web, something that we would, have we would have conducted in 2020, but we didn't have the opportunity because of the pandemic. Uh, in 2022, COVID-19 permitting, uh, we are planning on implementing uh, those two uh, modes, uh, starting one condition with face-to-face uh, -face and then uh, running them through our protocol, our outreach protocol, and then eventually doing some follow-up with non-respondents, sending them letters to invite them to continue on the web or to participate in the web. And the second condition is starting with an invitation to answer the questionnaire on the web and then following them up on face-to-face -face mode, uh, essentially reversing the order. And after that main study, we're planning on uh, conducting a um, uh, follow-on uh, study based on a subsample of those cases coming from all the from the two conditions and applying them a mini questionnaire for supplementary information that the GSS given that the questionnaire is already long and that follow-on study will allow us to um, include content that our board is recommending. Anyway, just to wrap up, um, we uh, uh, um, Today talked about uh, measuring changes in society and that sometimes it's important to change. So just to keep uh, measures relevant to uh, society in general at uh, key points in, in history, um, this uh, series of changes that we needed to embrace in our methodology and the future of the GSS will continue to be um, committed to serving the research community to further understand the impact of changes that may have happened in 2020 and balancing consistency on content and methodological innovation for the GSS. I thank you for listening and I think now uh, we can take a few questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much Renee for a fascinating presentation. I've got quite a few questions, but I'd encourage folks to um, post their questions in the Q&A. Um, I see that somebody has um, already done that. So Oshat has asked, uh, please excuse my pronunciation. I suspect I haven't pronounced your name correctly, but please forgive me. Um, asks you, Renee, um, says, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Could you tell us how long the online GSS took on average the questionnaire to complete? Thank you, great question. Uh, so we, we do have uh, some information from the panel. Uh, we're still cleaning the data for the cross-sectional, but it seems like it is not taking as long as we originally uh, anticipated uh, relative to the face-to-face. -face. Uh, it seems like it's it's taking um, a tad shorter. Uh, if you force me to give you a percentage, I would say something between 10 and 15 percent shorter relative to the to the face to face. Great. Um, I had a couple of questions um, about uh, the things you were talking about in relation to the to the questionnaire. Um, so you mentioned when you were talking about the changes you made to the questions which had the I we pronouns in them. Um, I wondered how you how you came how you came up with came to the point where you decided what you were going to make the change. You presented the changes that you made, but how, what were there any things that you did to inform your kind of decision making? Yeah, this this happened very very quickly uh, in a matter of even weeks. So we um, convened our board for an emergency meeting in 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 the summer. Traditionally, our board meets uh, in the spring and in the fall, um, but we asked them for help in the summer. And we um, presented to them the proposed changes that we, we were anticipating to do to the GSS, including how we were um, 
um, planning on doing the don't knows, the volunteered responses, and uh, the uh, first person pronoun, etc. And, and it was a, a collaborative process. Uh, so we we first proposed switching from I to we, and uh, but they helped us to finalize that by allowing us to do more more changes uh, within the questions. So in that sense, it was um, equivalent of um, a committee review, if you wish, as opposed to running through cognitive testing or other more traditional conventional forms of changing the questionnaire or an experiment even. Great, thank you. Um, and you mentioned the um, questions around um, the opinion questions. Um, and I wondered, you presented a slide um, which showed the impact of whether you included um, the um, the depends category. And there was a real shift in response options. Um, do you have any thoughts on why you saw such a dramatic shift? My, that's a great question. And I'm hoping that um, that is going to be a question for um, researchers uh, now that become uh, the data becomes available to see if you know that correlates with some demographics uh, in, in the data. I haven't been able to do any of that. And uh, I, I won't be able to do any of that uh, for two reasons. One, because the GSS is committed to give the data to everybody at the same time. Um, so we, we don't hold embargoes. Uh, so as soon as the data is clean, passes uh, quality control checks, it goes out for everybody to have that sort of uh, in the uh, GSS DNA. Uh, but I sort of have some suspicions. And uh, my guess is that perhaps is because it was an easy way out for respondents on the web. Mm -hmm. Some questions are quite sensitive in nature. So when talking about, you know, I don't know, beliefs, uh, opinions, etc., and that, uh, in in um, in people not being able to more to provide a more thoughtful response to some of those questions, that would say just well, yeah, it depends, and then move on. Um, relative to a situation where an interviewer is in there, that interviewer giving essentially an option other than you know, is this, is this a good or a bad idea, right? And sort of and potentially you know encouraging the interview in the interviewee to try to commit with one of those two options. Um, so in this instance, might be, uh, again, um, due to the fact that the mode in itself uh, may not prevent people from engaging in uh, satisfying, as it's called in the literature. But that's, that's just my hypothesis, we'll see. Yeah, it will be interesting, won't it, to see if, if there are any, um, you know, further research looking at that, because it was quite quite striking to me. Yeah. So we have a, a question from HM. Um, it says, thanks for an inspiring presentation. Um, you used an address-based sample in the web survey. How did you select the target person within the household? Good question. In, in the face-to-face -face, um, uh, mode, uh, we rely on uh, teach tables, and that depends obviously on rostering individuals within the household. In the web, that's just that's just not possible. Or I mean, it is possible. Let me take that back. It is possible, but it also risks uh, the possibility of people seeing a long and relatively boring, not so attractive process that they may, you know, uh, just keep up at that point. And we did. To, we wanted to minimize the risk of drop-offs at that point. So to facilitate the process of participating, uh, yet maintaining. Um, uh, a scientific principle behind the selection with the last birthday method as, as, as the selection mechanism. Um, when clearing the data, we are seeing that there are some um, uh, obviously um, discrepancies relative to uh, population controls, to benchmarks uh, on demographics. So we um, are developing post-certification weights to help us bring uh, some of the key demographics uh, in line with known benchmarks. Uh, we'll continue to do more experimentation on what might be the best mechanism to select a respondent in 2022 and 2024, but for 2020, we did uh, last birthday method. Okay. 
great, thank you. Um, any other questions, do post them in the Q&A. Um, I will abuse my uh, chair's prerogative <laughs> to ask another question, if I may. Um, how easy or difficult was it to implement the interve intervention plan that you mentioned around targeting underrepresented groups in practice? It was a it was a it was an opportunity that we weren't necessarily planning from the beginning. Uh, it, it was something that uh, we decided to implement uh, based on an effort to make sure that we had a representative sample. As I mentioned in the presentation, um, essentially we activated an unmaintained panel, and uh, because of concerns about sample composition, we thought that would was important to start monitoring uh, the composition precisely. And the tool that we found um, interesting and, and inadequate for that was our indicators. We had introduced before the topic of adaptive design in 2018, but was more as a conceptual framework than an actual tool. So for the conceptual framework was, all right, so we understand that some parts of the country may react different to different messages, messages for invitations. So the messaging that we did uh, was depending on the areas of the country. So some um, part of the country believe that, you know, higher education is quite important and everybody needs to go to college. There are other part of the country that believe that, you know, you know, life shouldn't depend really on whether you have a university degree or not. Um, and, and they have different viewpoints, et cetera. So we targeted um, um, our message to invite them to be part of, to represent their, um, their uh, demographic groups in our materials. In, in that sense, we adopted this uh, conceptual framework for adaptive design, same for incentives. So we do know that, you know, New York is way more expensive than, you know, any other area in, in the country, which may be in, in rural America. Uh, so by differentiating those aspects, we were more or less inspired by um, the adaptive design metric. But for the panel, it was more real because then we, we knew that we had data uh, from respondents in, that contributed to the study in 2016 and 18. So the possibility of doing that in a modeled way was, was a possibility, which we ultimately decided to do. Now, the challenge around that is the selection on what variables should inform the model, right? So because whether you pick variables related to abortion or to drunk, drug consumption or immigration, whatever may have different effects. And we have hundreds of variables. So that's the difficult part. I don't want to underestimate obviously the, the amount of work that takes to develop a model, but it's not an insignificant amount of work what goes behind selecting which topic might be the topic of the GSS or which is the more interesting topics in the GSS because it's a general survey. Great, thank you so much, Renee. We're at the end of our, our time now and I can't see any more questions. So I'd like to thank you on behalf of everyone who's attended today and ESS, City University and that's them for presenting uh, to us today. It's been an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, a recording of the talk will be made available. Um, you'll be, people will receive an email letting them know when, when that's available. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the invitation and thank you on behalf of my whole team. I'll see you next time. Great. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.